How's that audio? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you so yep. much again for doing this. I'm really keen and excited to hear what's going on for you at the moment because I know that, yeah, you've had so much happen in your life over the past, like, three to four years, would you say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah bit of an overhaul. Yeah, full revamp, but it's so good. Yeah, it's amazing, and I've sort of been following – your journey I guess since we met in like I think it was 2014 maybe it was like yeah. just as I was finishing uni in Brisbane yeah. um yeah. yeah so why don't you tell a bit us a little bit about how it all started I know um you went through some pretty like pretty dark stuff around yeah. that time so are you okay to open up about that yeah absolutely yeah so um yeah back a few years ago now lost uh, my best mate Justin in an accident he went on a holiday um, and, and unfortunately never came back from that holiday, so that sort of changed me a little bit, changed my perspective on life. Um, I was working as a chippy at the time, and I was doing a bit of work on a, a building that was done by his family business. I uh, came back after the funeral, and I went back to work probably two weeks later, and I was being a chippy for what did I do? probably about a, a month, and I just realized I was hating it. I didn't feel good about anything I was achieving, like, I'd finish a job and look at it and be like, oh, it's all right, it's nothing special. I just wasn't giving the client the sort of the quality work that I knew I was capable of and every day I would just wake up and not want to be there. So I threw the nail bag off the scaffold, essentially, um, quit, and then the next day chatted with Trent, the uh, owner of Crossfit Cooper, where I work now, um, said, look, I'm done. He had just gone through a bit of a change with his partner at the time. She was out of the business, so the head coach role came available and it sort of all lined up really well. And the next week I just jumped straight into the head coach role at, at CFC and haven't really looked back since then. That's Big awesome. challenge. <laughs> what is it that you love about CrossFit? Uh, I think it's good because you get, you get so many different people come in, so you don't just have like your – like I'm used to being in the football scene where you have your sort of your high-level athletes, but with CrossFit you get uh, – you can get someone come in that's 50, who's never done an exercise before in their life, or you might get a 20-year-old who's been training their whole life and you sort of – you watch them train, you know, transform, I guess, from one thing to another. You can get someone who comes in who's super overweight or come in with no confidence, and then in six months later they're a completely different person. So it's about – you know, it's – Anyone can, and anyone and everyone can jump in and give it a try and everything's sort of scalable or manageable for them, which is awesome. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool. I think the community as well, like that's what I've heard from a few people is that the community is like absolutely incredible. Yeah, I think the community is like you can't even put it in words. We had a CrossFit comp yesterday on the sunny coast and half the members came up to the drive, just took their Sunday off, which is normally their rest day, came up and cheered everyone on. So... It's like a big family. You've gone from you go from like your normal family, you know, your brother, your sister, your mum, your dad, and then you somehow have sixty other brothers and sisters, and yeah. it really, it's really good. You know, you can call on them at any time of the day and say, "I need someone to chat to," or "I need someone to help me move my fridge," and they'll jump at it. So it's pretty good. Yeah, it's so cool. I think that's something that like people are craving more and more nowadays is that connection and that community, especially yeah. with, like like-minded people. So was it with um, CFC that you did Lifting Above Violence? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So Lifting Above Violence originated four years ago now. So before I was sort of in, in the head coach role position, uh, Rebecca Stokes, who's one of our members, was was hit by a bloke in a club uh, a couple of days before Christmas, four years back now, and he's since you know fled from any charges, got nothing happened to him. And, Got off Scott Friend, she's got some serious issues with her health, and like she has you know, the occasional seizure and whatnot, and she's you know, entirely publicised what's happened to her. Um, and she started to sort of link up with Thomas Kelly, and they started lifting by violence, which was just a deadlift competition back in the day, and sort of kilos. Lifted was a dollar raise, and then I came on board 2016 for lifting by violence and decided to make it a little bit bigger and try to aim a little higher. So we ran our first one in 2016. We raised 10 grand uh, and then raised uh, this year gone. We had 20 grand raised and 190 athletes, I think, come through the doors, which is awesome. And lots of awareness for, for the Thomas Kelly Youth Foundation, which should do on really good things in the community. Absolutely. And so while all this was going on, you were investing in City Cave as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've jumped in board from on City Cave. I'm just a... Uh, 
25% shareholder in, in our stores and that's just, it's something I really believed in and I was a customer for a long time. Um, so when I, when I did lose Justin, I sort of had nowhere to turn and I didn't feel like going to speak to a professional, which in hindsight was a, was a big mistake on my behalf, but I, I sort of looked into different approaches and I found Floating through a friend and I gave it a crack. I know for the first couple of times, which is strange, I absolutely hated it. And the first two floats, I, I didn't tick off at all. I just sat there staring at the ceiling. Um, I find on the third time, I was able to just, you know, sort of switch everything off, just chill out. And I, I was asleep within 10 minutes. And it's probably the best sleep I've had since then. And now um, the position sort of came up and the boys, I've been really good friends with them and we talked about business opportunities outside of City Cave. And they approached me one day and said, did you want to, you know, we're looking to sort of expand. Would you look at investing um, and we can keep rolling with this thing and try to help as many people as we can because it's something the three of us, uh, Tim, Jeremy and I are involved there and we all sort of are on the same page that we want to really get to as many people as we can because it's, it's such a good tool to use for your, not only your mental health but your physical health as well, you know, an hour away from technology. You know what life's like at the moment with social media and I could be sitting here and if, if we were to go, if you were to duck off from me and I'd jump straight on my phone and check it. So it's going, it's going to a real negative sort of state of social media. Just to be away from your phone for an hour, I think, is, is probably one of the best benefits of it. Yeah, so it's a good, good thing to be invested in. I love it. Absolutely. Okay, so obviously floating is one way that you sort of maintain your mental health at the moment. What are some of your other, I guess, like tools that you've got in the arsenal? Heaps. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've got a, I've got a whole sort of broad spectrum of what I use when I, um, you know, a little bit off. I still get some real bad anxiety attacks that you don't really see coming. You just be sitting there and you sort of just go blank or you start stressing like something's going to happen. I, you know, I use, I use fitness for a big part of mine. I'll go do some training or spend a couple of hours in the gym just doing stupid exercises that probably aren't going to benefit me but to get my heart rate up and get sweaty and I find that really helps or try to get away down to the coast. As soon I find as soon as I leave the overpopulated Brisbane area and go outside like we spent a weekend at Sunshine Coast it's gone and I just feel a whole lot better. Everyone's just in a rush in the city to get to know where to get to a job to make money to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't really like. That was another thing I wanted to talk about as well. Obviously, like the mindset that you have now has shifted massively. And I guess the path that we've both taken is a little bit non-traditional in the sense that a lot of people look at this and think we're idiots. Um, how did you break out of that? And how did you deal with, you know, getting over the fear of like what other people thought of you and, you know, taking the road less traveled? Yeah. So it's really a long one. It started ages ago. So before Justin died, I got accepted into the, the army. And he sort of, he sat down and explained to me that there's three different people in the world, like he's got the dog bloggers, everyday people and the people that live in the sea. And at the time when he was talking about it, I didn't really take, take much in. I decided to, you know, not go down the army road because it was, it was putting an effect on my mum that I didn't really want to do and she was just raised me and it was really upsetting. So put that aside and I didn't really think more about the conversation I had with Justin until, until he passed away and I was thinking about this what kind of person I wanted to be and what type of, I guess, legacy I wanted to leave on, on life once I had left because I noticed the legacy he left, he had touched so many people in such a small small amount of time. And I didn't want to, you know, when my days up, like, all right, that's done, he's gone. I wanted to be able to sort of say that something I've done, lived on for my kids and their kids' kids. So I, cho I chose CrossFit because it's something I'm so passionate about, not just the, the fact that you're training every day, but more the fact that you have a community around you and if anything does go wrong or you need a hand, you've got, at our conference, you've got 150 people you can call at uh, the drop of the hat, they'll be there. Um, and then now I've gone down that sort of that mental health game. It's just because I feel like in the youth today, I'm actually in the process of starting a non-for-profit, which is exciting. Um, I feel like the youth just don't, they don't really find their purpose. They sort of waft and like exactly what you're doing is trying to help people find their purpose. They just sort of waft that they do a degree that they don't want to ever do. They do a trade that they don't want to do because they feel like they have this expectation, whether it's from social expectations or from their parents. They're like, oh, I've got to go out and get a good job or I've got to, I've got to get really good grades in my um, exams. Or So now I've sort of swung things around and 
trying to find people, you know, the road less travelled is the exciting road, you know. There's no point walking on the beach room where you can take the bush track. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Good. Very cool. So what about in your personal life? Like obviously you've got so much going on at the moment. How do you manage it all? Like do you have any really cool productivity hacks? No, no, I should. I definitely <laughs> should. Um, if you've got some suggestions, yeah. saying I'm old town forever forgetting things. Um, I just find like just I overcommit to things. I'm really trying to dial it back. Like I'll commit to seven things. Today, that you know, I really think I should probably just be giving 100% to one thing. So I'm trying to find my own hacks at the moment on not overcommitting. I think it's probably my, my worst trait is I'll do, say I'll do everything and then give 80% to everything when I'd rather be giving 100% to. But I've started to really figure out through reading reading a number of books like prioritizing things and a bit of a triage triage with my life, which is, which is starting to help a little bit, I think. Who are some of your favourite authors and like role models in the books that you're reading? I'm reading Richard Branson's book at the moment. I'm absolutely in love with it. Um, I didn't really read any of his stuff until about six months ago and I've since watched probably 70 hours of content online and really got into his book. And not so much for his his, um, his success. is obviously fantastic with the way he sort of goes about stuff. He'll, he'll take the... It would take the option that a lot of people try talking out of and just give it a crack. There you go. Sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. If you read his book, you'll see there's a lot of businesses you started that have flaked out pretty bad, and then there's the obvious ones that you see today that have really helped help sculpt the world that we have today. It's so not just in the in the business of making money, but he's done a lot of stuff with charities in Africa and stuff like that, which has been fantastic. And then also Tim Ferriss releases some really good content as well. So he's always he's always a good one to check out. Yeah, that's awesome. What does your morning routine look like at the moment? Morning routine today was a bit different. It was a real struggle with the alarm today. Um, my alarm goes off at four o'clock every day. Uh, get up, get changed, out of the door by quarter past four. Um, sometimes a little bit later. <laughs> I'm in the gym generally by 4.30 and I'll coach. I get the gym all set up, lights on, music pumping, get the vibe up. Clients start walking about quarter to five. I'll coach till eight o'clock usually. So today was just seven, quarter to early. Um, usually coach till about eight and then from eight to nine is my time. So, you know, that's why I take the book up to the coffee shop. I'll read the book for a bit, have a coffee, chat to the locals, which is always fun. We've got a lot of construction going on at the moment, so... There's going to be a big sort of community around Cooper for the stuff like that. And then 9 o'clock, I'm back in the gym and I'm approaching 9.30 class. And then I'm done at 10.30 and that's when I'm back here at the house. Even though I'm on the computer or building, you know, building my dream home, which is a little bit off at the moment. You'll get there. 100% you'll yeah. get there. Um, yeah. No, that's really cool. Okay, so with like, I know something that Richard Branson talks about a lot is this idea of like failure and making it really important to, yeah, fail fast and fail hard and fail often. How yeah. do you move through that like fear of failure? Because I know it's something that so many of us struggle with and it really holds a lot of people back from going after what they want. Yeah, absolutely. I have taken the approach that, the, and I've read it before, like, most definitely you can't with this. I just think there's no such thing as failure in your lessons. So I fail all the time, whether it be in the gym, whether it be in life, whether we taking an opportunity or something, you know, it's a, a terrible option to take. The only time I ever consider it's a failure if I, if I let myself get beat down, but usually I'll just go, all right, that was probably the wrong thing to do. Next time, let's do this instead, or let's take these steps before you just jump head in. So trying to take, like, you've got a swimming pool, is make sure you know how deep it is before you dive in. It's, it's helping me, but sometimes you're going to skim your nose on the bottom and just give you a back your um, and you yeah. just come back from, was it a 1,000 kilometre bike ride with Smiling for Smitty? 1,600, so a long way. Yeah, a long way and I'm not, I'm not, not a cyclist by any stretch of the imagination. So that was interesting, but um, you've got a lot of people, so there's a, uh, I don't know the bike says, telling or something like that, there's a big group of people, Peloton. There's a Peloton of 48 riders, so you've got a bunch of people around you pushing every day, so I was probably maybe middle of the pack in terms of strength on a bike. 
Uh, there's some people that, there's one bloke I know that pushed someone pretty much the whole bike ride, which is awesome. So the handy guy, they call it, and the hand comes up behind you and gives you a push up the hill. Uh, but it's really good, you know, you get to go to the local communities. We stopped in at a heap of schools. Um, I was lucky enough to get my face painted at every school stop, which was fun. Um, and just sort of trying to teach the kids the, the sun safety sort of message because there's a lot of a lot of communities out there where people are out in the sun all day, every day. Uh, we all know how, how much cancer can you know, affect everyone. I think everyone's got a story either directly or indirectly on cancer. So that was just another thing that I'm trying to, you know, get my get my head into and get get a little assistance in the community. It does break you, it mentally broke me on day two. Yeah. Two was really hard and day seven. Day seven we left at about six AM and I think we rolled in about seven PM and it was dark and there was a little bit of little bit of dew on the roads and it was not a cyclist, so I was stressing out and we finally pulled in at this um we finally pulled in at black black water, black water, I believe the town was. And then today we all do a huddle, and we did a huddle, and uh, this lady talked about her mental health battle she had had when she lost someone from cancer. She sang a song, and in the huddle of probably 60 people, I don't think it was a dry eye, and that, that really broke me. And then wake up on the day eight, and then you drive, you're riding back into Brisbane, and you finally realise where you were, and I just felt like this, this sensation come over my body that we had done it, and it was about 20 days ago, and it's yeah. the best feeling ever. That's awesome. And you ended up raising, I think you said before, over 600 grand in that ride. I think it was something like that. They, they raised an absolute ton of money. And I know Smiley for Smitty's kicked over 6 million now. Yeah. And they're, so that's that's something that they can uh, hold their heads very high over because that's a ton of money. And it was started uh, it was started from Adam Smitty. as a 22-year-old who got a melanoma. And I think six weeks later he was dead because of his melanoma. And uh, his best mate, Sharky, they talked about riding from Brisbane to Townsville a lot on the, the credit card ride. They called it with a backpack and a credit card. And uh, when Adam passed away, Sharky spoke to um, his parents and said, do you mind if I do the ride in honour? And it started from there. And this was their, their 12th year this year. And Sharky's done every ride since. And uh, unfortunately, since then, Maria, who is Adam's, Adam's mother, has also passed away from cancer. So David's left flying the flag and he's doing a really good job for him. Um, I wanted to talk about your blog. I know I think you started it just after you lost Justin. Can you tell me a bit about the importance of like writing and what yeah. that means to you, like having that creative outlet? Yeah, definitely. I've been a, um, I've been definitely been a bit slack on it the last couple of months, but I started it because when Justin died, I just had white white nose or white white haze in my head all day, every day, and I found just writing stuff down on paper was helping me. Um, someone suggested it to me. I think it might have been one of my um, one of my sisters or my sister or one of her friends. I can't remember. So why don't you why don't you start writing a blog? And I sort of brushed it off, didn't think anything of it. And then I read someone else's blog a week later, and I was like, oh, it was really good. It was really moving, and I got a lot out of it. And I thought maybe I could, you know, if I wrote a blog and one person had that feeling that I'd done the right job, started this blog and. So I get some really good traction off. I had a lot of people saying it was helping them through their own battles or whether it was motivating them to get in the gym a little often or speak to someone they haven't spoke to in a long time. And I just found as I was writing it, it was sort of in the process of me talking about my own sort of you know, mental health battles. Not that I've ever had, you know, diagnosed depression. I've just had those real ups and downs in life like most people most through the experience, I found that me opening up about my own sort of issues allowed other people to open up with it, and I think that was super powerful. So, yeah, yeah I really enjoyed it, and I'll definitely, it's definitely something I'll get back into when I've got an hour free in the next couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is, and that's what I always say, like, to my clients and stuff as well. Like, it literally gives other pe people permission to, yeah, like you said, open up about what they're going through, and... I always say when I'm writing anything, if it yeah has that effect on even one person, then it was worth it. And I think that if we all did that, yeah, the world would be a much better yeah, place. Yeah, I think if everyone wrote a blog, it'd be an interesting <laughs> read. Uh, everyone would feel a lot more open to talk about things. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Um, another thing I wanted to chat to you about really quickly was this idea of like what it means to you to be a man. Like I think we've got some really messed up ideas about masculinity in our culture and I don't think it gets a lot of like traction or airtime because, you know, there's a lot of focus with women around like negative body image and absolutely like well-deserved there. But to you, like I think what I've seen is men feel like they need to either be like getting lots of girls, earning lots of money or be like 
absolutely killing it in sport to feel like a real man. But what is it like? What does masculinity mean to you, and how's your journey been on that? Yeah, I think you nailed it. It's, um, I don't know. It's unfortunately sort of gone down that route where people think they need to be one of those three things to feel like they've really succeeded as a man. Um, one of my mates, Michael, gave me a really good analogy when we were having a meeting about the, um, this non for profit the other day. He said, blokes need to learn to be the hammer and also the tissue. So people often get the, the hammer and the nail analogy, but I think the hammer and the tissue works perfectly because there's a time when you need to, you know, you need to pull on your, your tough. Your tough exterior and, and get something done. There might be a tough time that you need to pull yourself through, but there's also a time where you need to let your, your guard down a little bit and you know reach out to someone if you're feeling like crap or someone said something that you know has upset you rather than turn to aggression or something. Just be like, look, mate, that's you know you can't really go around saying things like that or whatever you want to say to them. But I think yeah, you're definitely right. You know, you either need to be killing it at sport or getting all the girls or got driving around a Lamborghini and I think slowly we're going to come around full circle or I hope and I hope I can play a part in that and you know if we can get into the youth of today and the, the, the I guess the boys in school today and sort of let them find their purpose or find what they what their what their why is to go into Simon Sinek and talk about you know you don't need to be this big tough bloke or this big burly guy and you know walk around like you're the king of the earth just let your softer side out a little bit. And it doesn't mean we all need to be walking around crying, you know. There's a time and a place, but I think just people need to have the tissue and that the hammer analogy. I think it's going to be a really powerful one moving forward, and I really like that. Um, but yeah, once we sort of we sort of change that youth perspective, I think you see it in schools today. If like if someone's doing a little bit differently, especially in the man the man sort of world, if someone's doing a little bit differently, they're straight away sort of either bullied at school or subjectified for their opinions and I think in the next sort of 10 to 20 years we'll see it we'll see a really rapid change in that hopefully and I think we're all playing a part in that which is good there's a few of us out there trying anyway yeah 100 percent. and all the guys that I know and I've been meeting like in the last like five years have been like the most epic examples of like yeah these men that are really are like leading leading the way and um showing like yeah showing everyone like what it actually means to be a man which is exactly what you said having like both those sides and and I think like the more okay we make it as a culture and society for guys to sort of like show their emotions and express how they're feeling and have like healthy outlets um the less we'll see you know violence and crime and all of that other stuff that we're fighting against so yeah that's really cool. Um, yeah. Do you have any sort of like, obviously I talk a lot about like spirituality and stuff like that. Do you have any sort of spiritual practice or beliefs? Like do you ever, um, yeah, what's your like routine around that? I just find um, when I jump in the float rooms or the float tanks, I get really into the meditation and just sort of shut my eyes for a little bit. I've got a really good buddy of mine who I know does um, transit meditation where he walks around every morning. And he'll say those little quotes to himself, which I, I find super interesting. And if my morning schedule was a little bit more friendly, it would definitely be something I'd look into doing. But I know um, who talks about it. I can't remember. I had a, um, a Tim Ferriss podcast I listened to a few weeks ago. I think it was Ray Dahlia. He's a really big investor. He talked about it a lot. He talked about his little sort of mantra he'll say, and he'll repeat it to himself over and over for a 20-minute window in the morning. And then you'll find some time, 20 minute window in the afternoon. It just helps you think a lot clearer. And I've sort of slowly started bringing it in. I haven't, I haven't taken it on as a whole practice just yet, but I definitely, I definitely will be. And it just gives you that, that freer sort of mindset I find on things. But I'm not so much down the spiritual, um, spirituality. I guess as a lot of people are, which I really like. But I'm more just the making sure my mindset's in the right place. You know, the only limits you put on. The only limits you have are the ones you put on yourself. So I'm trying to make my limits as high as I can get them. That's awesome. I love that. I've been working on lately really, um, yeah, breaking through those ideas of what I thought was possible for me and what I'm, like, worthy and capable of actually experiencing. And it's been, yeah, it's been really cool. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, just quickly, um, how, like, what would you say for young people that are, like, looking to find their purpose? Like, what would you say to them? Any tips that you could give them? Yeah, definitely. I think the old um, there's the old mantra of uh, you have to go through the uh, you have to go through the bad times to really appreciate the good times. And that's one I'm really trying to 
get rid of because I think it's such a load of rubbish. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. I hate it. Some people like, oh, you know, you have to experience going through tough times to appreciate the good in life, which is a proper rubbish. Um, but uh, I find to, to, to find your purpose is to really break it down to a nutshell of what you would do, you know, if money wasn't an issue. If you had no bills to pay, everything was paid for for the rest of your life, what would you do that was going to make you happy? Um, and if that was, you know, finding other people's purpose is what we're trying to do is fantastic, whether that's, you know, riding horses, doing art, find the industry that you enjoy and that what makes you feel alive and what makes your heart beat out of your chest and try commercialize that, I guess, into a sense where you can then make enough money to sort of house yourself and house your family and then everything else sort of grows from there. I think if you're doing something that you're passionate about and that you you genuinely want to make a difference in, then I guess money will money will come eventually. So, so many people pick an industry when they're in school because they want to be a doctor because there's money in being a doctor or they want to be a physio or a sports star and all these things. And it's purely based on the, the preconceived fact that you need to have money to survive in life, which is if you go over to the third world countries, you see what they survive off. I think they're doing pretty bloody good here. So, yeah, I, I think to find a purpose is to find what makes you happy and what makes you tick and then find a, a career in that industry. So for me, it was what made me happy was when I was training, when I was helping other people. I found when I was doing footy in the pre-seasons, I would always want to be out in front, but I would always want to be dragging people with me. So I thought... What can I do in the fitness industry? CrossFit sort of lined up with that. And now getting into the non-for-profit sector, I find helping kids find their purpose and just talking to kids about dropping that exterior of being the tough guy is what's making me really happy. I don't think I've been as happy as I am at the moment in a long, long time, so it's good. Awesome. That's absolutely epic. What's your idea of utopia? Like what's the kind of world that you want to create? Um, so the one I'm working on at the moment is – Instead of lowering suicide rates, it's completely getting rid of it. I think um, in 2016, we had 202 kids kill themselves between 15 and 19, which is absolutely staggering. Um, so, yeah, the, the world, world of utopia for me would be a, a world where we know exactly, you know, no one's going to kill themselves this year. Or the suicide, it's a radical suicide, no longer a word. If we can delete the word suicide out of the, the English dictionary, then that's, that's utopia for me. Uh, is there anything else that you want to say or bring up or touch on or share? Um, not really. I'm just, yeah, how good's living. That's the biggest thing. That's the yeah. thing. If everyone, sort of, if everyone sort of takes a step back out of their life and realises how good we really have it. You, know, you might be having a bad day, but in the big perspective, just realise how, how good it is to be allowed them to live in Australia or wherever we are around the world to, to have that life. I think um, Gary V says he's uh, four times more likely to win the lottery to ever have a life. So you're doing pretty good. Yeah, 100%. Well, I am so freaking proud of you. I'm so grateful to know you and to be able to watch your journey unfold. You really are like pioneering this whole new way of being in the world. And um yeah, it's just an absolute joy to watch. So you're amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the world. No worries. Oh, you too. I'm, I'm really enjoying watching your stuff. Keep it coming.